Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina McKee, and I am the program director of the Albright Institute. Thank you so much for joining the Albright Institutes today for our lunch uh, dialogue. Um, Lessons from the Edge, a conversation with Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch. A quick reminder that this event will be recorded and our live stream will be starting soon. You are welcome to continue eating and drinking during the dialogue, but at this point I do request that you silence or turn off your phones. And now I'd like to invite to the stage President Paula Johnson, Professor Stacy Goddard, and our distinguished visiting professor, Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and I thank you for joining today's public dialogue the culmination of our winter session at the Albright Institute for Global Affairs. This three-week period allows the approximately 40 Wellesley juniors and seniors in all majors chosen each year as Albright Fellows to learn intensively about global issues and then to explore and present on those issues in multidisciplinary groups. Congratulations to all of our fellows on your outstanding work. I have heard that you have been extraordinary this year. Although the problems and ideas addressed at the Albright Institute are extremely complex, its mission is very simple, to educate women for leadership in international affairs. The subject of this year's winter session could not be more apt making the world safe for democracy. As we consider the many threats to democracy, both foreign and domestic, playing out at this moment in history, we're also honoring the founder and the greatest teacher of the Albright Institute, former Secretary of State Madeleine K. Albright of Wellesley College, class of 1959, who we miss so much. For Madeline, the fight for democracy was personal. She was a refugee twice over. When she was a child, her Czech family was forced to flee the Nazis in 1939 and the Soviets in 1948. She has said that when they finally arrived in the United States, her father worried that Americans took their democracy for granted. From childhood on, she saw democracy as a gift one that had to be actively cherished and defended and practiced every day. During this winter session, our students have learned to use what Madeline called the diplomat's toolbox in service of democracy. Clearly, two of the most powerful tools in the box are integrity and courage. And so today, I am so pleased to welcome to Wellesley a diplomat who possesses both of these tools, the former United States Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch. <laughs> Democracy is personal for Ambassador Yovanovitch as well. She too had parents who fled both Stalin and Hitler. She became a three-decade career member of the United States Foreign Service to give back to the country that had done so much for her family. She rose to posts as US ambassador to Kyrgyzstan and then to Armenia. As ambassador to Ukraine from August of 2016, she made addressing corruption a priority and as you can imagine, made some enemies. They managed to plant false claims about her with the Trump administration, and she was pulled from her post in 2019, shortly before President Trump tried to pressure the newly elected Ukrainian President Zelensky to investigate the Bidens. I'm sure that many of you felt as I did watching her testimony during the subsequent impeachment inquiry, grateful and proud that our country has such brilliant, courageous, 
dedicated, and thoughtful people quietly working behind the scenes to defend our freedoms and the rule of law. Today, Ambassador Yovanovitch is a senior fellow at the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. Leading the conversation with her is Dr. Stacy Goddard, the Betty Fryhoff Johnson Class of 44 Professor of Political Science and the Paula Phillips Bernstein, Class of 58, Faculty Director of the Albright Institute for Global Affairs. Stacy's research focuses on issues of international security that include legitimacy, rising powers, and territorial conflict. As Madeleine Albright said, to secure the promise of liberty, we have to band together in support for critical thinking, education, and the truth. Thank you, Stacy, for all that you do in support of critical thinking, education, and the truth. Ambassador, again, we are so honored to have you with us. So now, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Yovanovitch and Professor Stacy Goddard. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, thank you to all of you who are here, members of the Wellesley community, our Albright ambassadors, and, and of course to the fellows um, who've just had a spectacular few weeks, and a special thank you to you, of course, Ambassador Ivanovich. Um, so this is our annual public dialogue. Uh, we always have this to close out our winter programming at the Albright Institute. And as Paula mentioned, our theme this year is the diplomat's toolbox, making the world safe for democracy. And we chose that theme to honor Secretary Madeleine Albright, both to recognize her commitment to public service, her work as a diplomat, but also to recognize her commitment to democracy. She wrote and talked about and defended democracy right up to the very end of her life. And one of the reasons that she wanted this institute to exist was that we could all come to think deeply and critically about it, what it means to defend democracy. I've already mentioned the fellows. What's amazing to me is that while we chose that theme to honor Secretary Albright, we very well could have chosen it to honor you as well, Ambassador Ivanovich, and your own commitment to public service and democracy. And it's the latter where I'd like to begin my questions. And I'd like to actually begin where your book ends, because your book ends in talking about challenges to democracy. And arguably, we're seeing more challenges to democracy now than we have since perhaps the middle of last century. You've been particularly vocal in calling for the support of Ukraine against Russia's aggression and saying that this really is about protecting democracy, not just about protecting Ukraine, but about protecting democracy. Could you say a bit about that? What is that challenge to democracy? What's at stake in this conflict? Yeah, <clears throat> I think the, stake, uh, the stakes are, uh, just couldn't be higher in, this, um, in Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, a war that Russia has chosen to prosecute. I mean, it started in 2014 and continued at a low level. And then, as we all know, uh, in February of uh, 2022, uh, Vladimir Putin chose to have an all-in invasion, which he thought would take three days. Uh, you know, his officers packed their dress uniforms for the victory parade. Um, and it turns out that Putin uh, made three miscalculations. One was um, that the Ukrainians actually are a people that they were going to fight back, and they knew exactly what they were fighting for. Um, secondly, um, that the West would um, be united and stalwart and stand by Ukraine as it continues to do today. And, you know, I mean, that was not, uh, you know, it wasn't only um, President Putin who made the miscalculation that the West would not do that. And then thirdly, that the Russian military was all-powerful and would be able to actually um, um, uh, meet the goals that, um, that President Putin had set for the military, and that turned out to be wrong as well. 
And so this is a war about Ukraine. It is a war about expanding Russia's empire to include Ukraine, uh, which Putin believes in a misreading of history belongs exclusively to Russia, that um, there, are, there is no such thing as a distinct Ukrainian people, a distinct Ukrainian language or culture. And you know, I have to say that one of the things that I've found really heartbreaking in this war, um, in addition obviously to the human toll, but um, the deliberate eradication of Ukrainian culture. Um, because what Putin has found is that actually, well, maybe he hasn't discovered this, but others um, in, uh, in, in Russia have, that there actually is a Russian culture and, and language. And so what are they doing? They're going after the museums. They're going after the artwork, the cultural works. Um, they're going after libraries. Um, they're going after paintings. They're going after the church. I mean, it is shocking and appalling and actually meets one of the definitions of genocide. Um, so I think that... It is, this war is about Ukraine and, um, you know, expanding the empire and owning Ukraine, but it is about much more than that because what Putin is trying to do is to reset the global international order so that um, the, um, the norms, um, the principles that uh, the world has basically been following since World War II when we all said never again, including the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a signatory to many of the conventions, whether it was the UN, whether it was uh, World Bank, other, other institutions that um, uh, you know, uh, were established after, um, after World War II in order to create a structure that would make the world a safer place for all of us, including the Soviet Union and of course now Russia. And so that included principles that are, you know, bread and butter, um, principles like territorial integrity, the, um, uh, you know, the non viable, the, the, um, that, that borders should, are inviolable and should not be, um, be crossed by, um, by uh, other countries, that um, the, the use of uh, force or the threat of force is unacceptable. Um, that um, countries have a right to determine their own policies and um, their own futures. And so, um, you know, these principles, I mean, sometimes observed in the breach, it is true. You know, we, we haven't been perfect over the last um, 70 years, and the U.S. has not been perfect either. Um, but more or less, we followed those um, those. Uh, those principles, and um, I think it can't be argued that the world in general has been a safer, more prosperous, more democratic place than at any other time in human history. I mean, if you were gonna choose a time when you wanted to live, even if you are um, not well off, you know, this is the time to do it. And it is in part because of those principles that were agreed, the institutions that were established, and the commitment by countries around the world to live by them. And so what Vladimir Putin is doing is saying, I'm not going to live by those, those, um, those principles. I am going to take Ukraine because I want it. Um, it's going to be a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of a world. It's going to be, um, you know, strong countries get to do what they want, and littler countries are going to just have to put up with it. And um, we are going to do what we want, and there aren't going to be any kind of rules. So, you know, some might say, well, the U.S. is a strong country, stronger certainly than Russia. Why do we care about that? Well, we care about it for two reasons. And the first reason is principle. You know, this is just wrong. Um, Ukraine is a, a democracy, um, you know, a struggling democracy like all of, a, uh, all of them are, including our own. Um, but it's a democracy, and this is just wrong. And Russia has, over the last 30 years of independence, Russia's and Ukraine's, Russia has, um, you know, um, uh, observed and agreed and signed on to various treaties and agreements um, that, um, that uh, indicated Ukraine's independence. And Russia had pledged in, in many different ways to observe that and respect that. Um, so this is just wrong, and I think we felt that we could not stand by as a matter of principle. But secondly, as a matter of our own security, because if Russia gets away with this in Ukraine, Russia is going to keep on going. And so that may sound a little paranoid, but if you look at what Russia has done over the centuries, but let's just keep to <laughs> you know, the time of Putin's rule, um, it, you know, Putin's um, rule is an era defined by war, where he has um, you know, first the Chechen war, which was an internal war, extremely brutal. 
Um, and uh, the international community didn't really say very much about it. Um, and Putin got away with it and, in fact, was elected president on, on the back of that, uh, president of Russia for the first time. Uh, and then there was uh, the war in Georgia where uh, Putin went, uh, um, the Russians went in, fast little war, they kind of grabbed two chunks of Georgia um, and um, have really destabilized that country. Um, and then there was, of course, the first Ukraine war in 2014, um, which um, ended with two agreements, Minsk, um, Minsk agreements, um, where there was a nominal ceasefire, there were lines um, that were agreed to, but Russia never really observed that. And you know, every week that I was in Ukraine during, you know, from 2016 to 2019, three or four Ukrainians would die. Sometimes soldiers on the front lines, sometimes um, civilians who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, you know, near the front lines. Um, you know, that is not a ceasefire. <laughs> that is not peace. And so, you know, I thought that. Russia would be content with destabilizing Ukraine in that way. You know, the war in the east, um, the cyber attacks, uh, the disinformation attacks, assassinations in the heart of Kyiv of key government officials, pretty destabilizing and, um, you know, is, uh, is very uh, difficult for Ukraine to move forward, including in its international aspirations of wanting to e join the EU and perhaps NATO at some later time. Uh, and then, you know, then we had the incursion in, uh, not the incursion, but the invasion um, in 2022 of a full-scale invasion with a goal of taking all of Ukraine. Um, and so I, you know, I look at that history and I think we are kidding ourselves if we think that um, if Russia isn't defeated by Ukraine, that Russia isn't going to keep on going. Because if you look at what the writings of Vladimir Putin, if you look at what he has said, as well as those around him, they have made it clear that they have greater aspirations. And so it is in the interests of the United States to help Ukraine stop Russia in Ukraine. Um, these are our security interests. It's as, it's as simple as that. So if I could follow up, I mean, given what you've said, so this is not simply about Ukraine, and to be clear, very much about Ukraine, but also about democracy and also you're suggesting at stake is a rules-based order, right. so to speak. Given that, is what the United States and its European allies doing enough right now? Well, here's what I would say. I think the U.S. and its allies, and not just European allies, but you know, Japan, Australia, other countries as well, um, they're doing far more than I think anybody would have anticipated on January of you know, 2022. Nobody would have guessed how united we'd be, how, how strong our support for Ukraine. That said, I think that we need to provide far more and far more quickly um, in order to help the Ukrainians um, prevail against Russia. In my view, uh, the Russians cannot succeed militarily. And it's not, it's not just my view. I mean, I'm, I'm like quoting my military colleague friends who, who, who just say, I mean, the Russians can't succeed militarily. And even if they do grant them that, um, that they succeed militarily, they will be fighting a guerrilla war in Ukraine for years because the Ukrainians have understood um, that, um, that this is a war of annihilation, uh, that what the Russians want to do is destroy the Ukrainian people, destroy the Ukrainian culture. So they have no choice. They have to keep on fighting. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it, 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 the war is going to continue for some time. So when we look at Putin's aggression against Ukraine, that, that's an obvious and clear threat to democracy. But certainly in your time in the region, right, you saw what we might think of as quieter threats to democracy. And, and the one that comes to mind, certainly reading your book, is corruption. Mm -hmm. right? Corruption in your account, whether or not you were in Ukraine, Armenia, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, seemed rampant. What allowed corruption to become so embedded in these societies, in these states? Yeah, so that is such an interesting question. Um, and, you know, what I concluded was that it's because, you know, governments are about providing services to the people, right? I mean, you know, we're not there for governments, they're there for us. And that is the genius of democracy where, um, you know, if our governments aren't, um, you know, um, 
producing, producing the services the, the, and providing for our needs, that we can vote the bums out. We can hold them accountable and vote somebody else in for another try. Um, in the, so the former Soviet Union, that wasn't the case. I mean, there were elections, but they were sort of sham elections with, you know, one person running <laughs> and getting, you know, 99% of the vote, sometimes 101%. <laughs> so um, in, in the Soviet Union, the people really existed for the state. The state was all centrally, it, there was central command structures, all decisions came from Moscow, and so if, um, you know, whether they were economic, security, political. And so, um, you know, if you wanted to go to Moscow State University, somebody in Moscow would decide whether or not, you know, which university you were gonna go to, what job you were gonna have when you graduated from college, um, where you would live, um, and, um, you know, what kind of boots you were gonna buy that winter, because there would be a, a, a command given out of Moscow that um, in the part of the Soviet Union that made boots, because the economy was kind of divided up um, territorially, and so there's like one boot factory, and they would make, you know, black suede shoes. And if you didn't want black suede boots, too bad, that's all that was on sale in the Soviet Union that year. That's like not a great way to run a country. I mean, that's a, a, a silly little example, but it, it is um, you know, kind of across the board, that's the way it was. And um, you know, uh, resources did not go to the people for a better life or anything like that. So when I was a student in Moscow, um, another anecdote, I, um, I had friends who uh, you know, got an apartment in the outskirts of, of Moscow, and of course they wanted a phone. Uh, in their new apartment, right? And this is in the days, some of you may not know about these days long, long ago, before <laughs> cell phones, <laughs> uh, but, but trust me, it's true. So you had to have a landline. And um, the waiting list for a landline was three years. Well, you know, that's a long time not to have a phone. And so, you know, people are resourceful and they're gonna find another way. So they're gonna find the telephone guy in their neighborhood and they're gonna to talk to him about you know, putting them on the, at the top of the list and they're gonna make, make sure he has, call it whatever you will, a bribe, a consideration, a gift, you know, something for their daughter, whatever you wanna call it. Because people, you know, like I said, people are resourceful, they're gonna find a way, they're, they're not going to put up with a three year wait. And um, I think that's, that's how corruption happens, where um, the government isn't providing the services. In a place like the Soviet Union, there was no private sector to be you know, the facilitator for where the government doesn't, doesn't, doesn't step in. And so people find a different way, and there becomes a parallel black market economy. Mm -hmm. And that was the system throughout the Soviet Union. And when the, the, the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, it's not like all of a sudden that parallel system went away and you know, it was rainbows and unicorns and democracy and market economy and everything else. It was still the same system and pretty much the same leaders. The people who had, uh, in each of the republics that were now independent countries, um, you know, old so, um, you know, Politburo hacks, basically, who, you know, were communists, whether by conviction or out of necessity for their political ambitions, um, but they didn't know anything about democracy or market economy or really how to run a state and to how to provide services for people. So, um, so the old system just continued on, um, and. Um, you know, over time as, um, as the peoples in each of these countries either put up with it or didn't in the case of the Ukrainian people, um, things changed. Mm -hmm. At the same time, so we have this idea of, uh, of corruption abroad and we understand what that system looks like. One thing that struck me as I was reading your book is that moment that you begin to talk about, you had thought about corruption as something abroad. Yeah and how much it was becoming embedded at home in the United States yeah. as well. So I'm curious, what was the moment you had that realization? And, and to kind of bring that out broader, given your own experiences, how much of a challenge do you think corruption in the United States now poses to democracy? Well, that's a really, really good question. And the short answer is, I don't know. Um, but I can tell you that when, um, when I saw, um, you know, kind of bad actors basically who were around the president of the United States, 
um, you know, in partnership with corrupt actors in Ukraine, um, peddling lies um, and defaming me, basically. Um, you know, it was it was really shocking. And you know, why are they doing these things? And you know, going back to Washington, um, the official part of Washington, and asking, you know, what's going on? And my bosses, who are you know the professionals, the civil servants, etc., and even some political appointees, saying, no, 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 you don't have to worry. You're doing a great job. And during this time. They actually asked me to extend for another year at my time in Ukraine. Um, so there was kind of a parallel um, system going on there. And um, unfortunately, um, those um, you know, closest to the president kind of prevailed. I mean, the lies um, took hold, and I was removed from my post. And so that was obviously a very, very difficult uh, time for me because um, you know, in the end, um, you know, I came through that dark period, but I didn't know that going into it. I mean, it didn't feel like, um, like I'd be sitting on this stage with you, with all of you great people. Um, it felt like um, I had worked for 33 years and tried to do the best I could for the American people and that my reputation was going to be in tatters, and that's how people would remember me. It was a terrible time. And I, I want to pick up on something here, because thinking about these quieter strategies, these quieter mm -hmm. anti-democracy, we've talked about corruption, there's disinformation, mm -hmm. obviously, and, and, and the kind of stripping away of any sense of truth and, and, and evidence. You were obviously on the other side of, of one of those campaigns. From that experience, or just from your observations of disinformation, what what steps can individuals take to attempt to combat that? It is really, really hard because uh, there have been studies done. You know, with the way our brains work, um, there have been studies done that the first thing you hear is what sticks with you, and so if the lie is the first thing you hear, that sticks with you, and um, you know somebody can come in with the truth. And maybe that will um, change the narrative for some individuals for a while. But if you go back to the individual in six months, they'll come back with the first lie that they heard. And so it's, you know, for a layperson such as myself, I'm like, oh, gosh, how do you even combat that? But I think the answer, I mean, looking at you, looking at President Johnson, at the other educators in the room, is um, education, uh, is teaching. Um, children from a very, very young age, um, but also, um, you know, in college and throughout, to be uh, critical thinkers. You know, not in the sense of criticizing everything, but to, but to look at things with skepticism, with um, appropriate skepticism, um, to question if, um, if a statement seems wildly crazy. You know, could that possibly be true? Well, okay. Well, let's let's kind of look into it. But the thing is, you know, most people don't have that time. You know, they're like you know, getting the carpool ready, they're running off to their jobs. They just don't have time to critically assess every piece of news and it kind of goes in one ear and sometimes stays as like a little earworm, uh, a dangerous little earworm. Um, but I do think that education is the way to go. If this is ingrained in us from the very young age, um, to be um, skeptical, to be, to, to be thinking critically. It will help with, with these kinds of things, but also with all sorts of things. Um, and I will share with you that when I was in Ukraine, we, um, through USAID, we had a pilot program on disinformation. Um, at the middle school level, so kids in fifth, fifth and sixth grade, which you would think, you know, that's kind of young, isn't it? Um, but this, the, the, the idea was the teachers would share a story uh, with their students, and then they would ask the student to, uh, or the students, um, to investigate and you know kind of trace it back and everything else. And the students would find out, you know, as they go back, um, you know, through all of the different layers and realize it's all a big lie, um, they would get really angry and they were like, they're trying to deceive us. And that was really powerful because you know kids, just like the rest of us, don't want to be manipulated. And so I think you know, starting those practices young is important. I think this is going to be one of the challenges, frankly, of our times, of you know, your generation, of how do we, how do we get this right? Um, and there's a lot of work being done on this right now, but it's still, I think, a work in progress. I want to pivot a bit um, so we can talk ab about your remarkable career um, as a Foreign Service officer and as an ambassador. And, and, but I want to start a little high level. <laughs> Because again, going to the end of your book, among, alongside your discussion of democracy, you have this really impassioned plea 
to rebuild the institutions of diplomacy, um, which were really, really left a bit in tatters um, after the last administration. Just kind of give an overview. Why is diplomacy so important as an instrument? When, why and how do we need to reinvest? Yeah, so I think diplomacy is, um, you know, at its, at its core, it's about the relationships that we, the United States, have with other countries. Um, and so it's about relationships, and those relationships can be really strong, the special relationship with the UK, or they can be, um, you know, adversarial, <laughs> um, or they can be, you know, somewhere in between, you know, allies, um, partners, um, kind of neutral countries. But we always have, um, you know, the United States has interests all over the world. They could be economic interests, they could be security interests, they could be, you know, an American citizen who's in trouble in some far off, uh, you know, in the Himalayas somewhere and we need to get a helicopter there or whatever. Um, we have interests and, and one of the things, you know, when we need a country to step up to help us, um, you know, whether it is help us um, providing military equipment to Ukraine or providing uh, economic assistance to a country in need or a country that is having a natural disaster and getting ships with, um, with food and fuel to that country. Whatever it is, whatever our ask is, it's built on a relationship. And, um, you know, if you come in and say, oh, hey, we'd like you to spend $100 billion on something, you know, the answer is likelier to be yes if um, you've had a long-standing relationship with a country. And so what diplomats do in the best of times is what George Shultz, um, President Reagan's Secretary of State, called tending the garden. And so, you know, those of you who are gardeners and maybe some of you who just enjoy gardens know is that um, you need to tend the garden every day. You need to nurture the beautiful flowers, maybe snip them back here and there. You need to pull the weeds um, so that um, you know, the bad actors, the bad actor weeds don't, um, don't you know, threaten the, the roses. And all of the things that goes into um, nurturing a, a, a beautiful garden. And in this case, the garden is the world. And so, you know, he kind of extended that metaphor that what we need to be doing is having positive, you know, trying to establish positive relationships with as many um, countries as possible. And even if you can't establish a positive relationship, at least the lines of communication are open so that if there's a plane disaster or something, an airplane disaster or something like that, that we have a number to call, right? And we can get cooperation on a narrow set of issues, but nevertheless, that's important. And so, um, and then of course with adversaries, you want to make sure that they know where you stand and that you, you know, there may not be mutual understanding as we call it in diplomacy, but um, what they do need to understand is that we're serious and that if we say something, we mean it and we will deliver. Mm -hmm. And they need to take that into account. So, um, you know, that is kind of, uh, you know, not very, um, not very glorious kind of work of just, you know, every day, uh, you know, when you're in a country overseas, having dinner with the foreign minister, taking his pulse, finding out what's going on in the country, uh, reporting back to Washington that it looks like there's probably going to be a change of power and we need to be starting to reach out to the opposition in a more serious way because likely they will be taking over. You know, so there's the reporting function, but there's also the relationship building function. And one of the things the US does everywhere in the world is we try to keep, again, open lines of communication with all sides. I mean, there's some exceptions, but with all sides of the political spectrum in, in a country so that we're not surprised if all of a sudden there's a coup, we have the phone number of you know, the people who are behind the coup and we can at least find out what's going on and safeguard American citizen lives. So it's, that's a really long answer to your question, um, and it's not even the whole answer. <laughs> um, but what I would say is, is that um, enables us to you know, be ready for the crisis, mm -hmm. um, but it's not you know, front page headline news, it's not sexy, and people don't necessarily understand it. It's like, you know, why, why are we doing this? Why do we really need to do it? Well, we need to, you know, when the crisis comes, we understand why we need to do mm -hmm. it, but you have to be ready for that crisis, just like the military. I, I feel like as a failed gardener, I'm now completely intimidated, which is a nice segue to my next question, which is that you served in the Foreign Service Office for, for decades. This is not an easy job. 
Right? You moved every few years. You were in areas that were not safe. What drew you to this career in public service, and how how did you stay with it? Yeah. So, I mean, I should just, you know, the, the headline first. I loved my 33 years in public service. I loved working uh, for the State Department. And, um, you know, I didn't love every single minute, but mostly I loved it. And I'll come back to why in a minute. So, I, my parents, um, I mean, you heard in the introduction, we were immigrants to the United States. Um, they lived under totalitarian regimes. Um, they understood what it was, as, you know, Madeleine Albright's family did. Uh, what it was to live uh, not in a democracy. And so when they came to the United States, they were so grateful to be here. Um, you know, they could say what they wanted, they could worship as they wanted to, uh, and they could raise my brother and myself the way they wanted to, and with opportunity, even though we had nothing when we came to the United States. But we were able to get good educations and, um, you know, and, 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 and move on. And that was something my parents were really grateful for. They were both teachers. And um, they believed in, in giving back, you know, that that's what we all need to do because, you know, anybody, you know, no matter what your background is, um, anybody who's sitting in this room is privileged and, and has, in my opinion, in my parents' opinion, the obligation to, to share that f good fortune and to, um, to help other people along the way in whatever way you choose. And that's how my parents brought us up. And so, you know, I took a lot of detours in my youth, and I'm all for detours. I mean, do as much as you can, learn as much as you can. Um, but, um, uh, you know, uh, I went to Princeton University, and the motto there was Princeton in the nation's service. And, you know, from the very first um, lecture that we had in Alexander Hall, you know, on day one of being a freshman, um, where Bill Bradley, who some of you may know, was a very famous um, basketball player and kind of a god back in the day and about to embark on a senatorial career, um, he, you know, he started that, that drumbeat of Princeton in the nation's service. You know, Princeton in the nation's service. What are you going to be doing when you graduate? And so, you know, that kind of stuck with me. And so, like I said, a couple detours here and there. Um, but um, uh, I was working in New York. I was 27, so, you know, not a spring chicken. Um, and um, there was um, the war in Granada, which um, I was shocked by this. And I, when I went into the office and wanted to talk to my colleagues about it, they weren't very interested. And I realized that I needed to be doing something else. I was in advertising and marketing, learned a lot. Um, but I needed to be doing something uh, in the foreign policy vein because that was my passion. That's what I was interested in. And so that's when I started thinking um, more seriously about the Foreign Service, and I joined the Foreign Service after um, you know the, the long process to get in. And and it's been great. I mean, there have been ups and downs, uh, but what I love about the Foreign Service is that you can make a difference in people's lives. You know, you're not always going to you know achieve peace in the Middle East, <laughs> but you can. You know, if you're in Israel or um, in the region, you can plant the seeds for that whether it is through civil society, whether it is talking to various um, political actors, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, you can make a difference. And I have to tell you, and I think I told the fellows this yesterday, that whether you're American, whether you come from another country, there is no greater honor than to be working in an office with your country's flag in the corner. Because it is, it is about something that is bigger than just you. It's about representing uh, your people. It's about representing your country and hopefully making contributions to a better and more peaceful, more democratic world. So I have to ask, because as you well know, not every foreign service officer rises to the rank of ambassador. The ambassadors are a mix of career diplomats and political appointees. Is there something that you would tell the fellows that you would give credit to your, your, your rise to ambassador? Is there, is there a skill that you developed um, that was different than others? Was it luck? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to say something, and um, maybe some of the women in the room will say, no man would ever say that. It, partly it was luck, because, um, I mean, I, I should tell you, I didn't go into the Foreign Service thinking that I was going to be uh, uh, an ambassador. That did not seem like it was a possibility. Um, and I didn't even aspire to it. But with the break apart of the Soviet Union, you know, there had been one embassy in Moscow. And all of a sudden, there are 15 countries, including uh, Russia, 15 countries that need ambassadors. 
And um, most of them, you know, all those countries were Russian speaking at the time. I spoke Russian. I was too junior at that point to be an ambassador in 1991, but it created all this opportunity for people who had regional expertise um, and spoke, spoke the languages um, to, um, you know, to be considered for senior positions in those embassies. And so, yeah, there was, there was some luck. But I will also tell you that I think you make your own luck, which is that, um, you know, you have to, you know, it's not very exciting, but you have to work hard. <laughs> you have to work hard, you have to put in, um, you know, put in the time and, um, you know, try to be creative um, when it comes to problem solving. I mean, all of the things that you would expect. I mean, it's not just, you know, kind of being tapped on the shoulder and voila. Um, you have to, you know, um, show that you are capable of being ambassador as well. Right, and so it's that combination. Yes, it's luck. And I actually think it's nice to make space for some luck. I mean, we don't actually all control our own destinies, but to realize it's that match between the opportunity yes. and your skills and yeah. your talents that you've hopefully honed. Um, you brought up the fact that you, you might be more comfortable saying this because you're a woman, so let's talk about that part. Let's talk about gender and, and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't always easy no. being a woman in, in the Foreign Service. Um, again, from, from, from your book, one of my favorite passages are when you are ambassador and you are asked to pose with a plate of cookies. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Can we talk about that or other obstacles that you faced as a woman and how you, you worked to move past those? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the State Department, uh, the military, um, the, rest of the, um, the rest of the federal government are reflections of society as a whole, right? I mean, they're, they're not separate entities. Um, and I mean, they all have their differences and their different cultures, but they are reflections of society as a whole. And so, um, you know, I started working in the 1980s in, in New York City. And, um, you know, my, my, my uniform was actually, you know, a little black suit, which I guess I still have. Um, but, but they were different then. They were very, um, they were like little man suits, you know, very structured, big shoulders and huge shoulders, <laughs> very architectural, one might say. And, um, and I wore um, this little fake tie, basically. I mean, they, they're, they have a terrible name, pussy bows. And that, like a little foulard that came, um, uh, you know, down my throat, and that's the way women dressed back then because we were trying to pretend we were little men, um, and um, so I, you know it was, you know, that's the way New York was, um, and when I went to Washington, it was it was pretty much the same except there were fewer women, <laughs> and um, I, um, you know, again, basically put my head down and worked hard. There was a lot of overt sexism um, in, uh, in the department, but people didn't recognize it as such. I mean, people, men thought nothing of saying um, a woman can't be a political officer, you know, or a woman needs to, um, you know, give way to her husband's career in the Foreign Service, and so you need to take, you know, a different assignment. That was acceptable in that time in the State Department. It's not acceptable anymore. I mean, there have been uh, a lot of improvements, uh, in part because of a class action lawsuit that um, you know, took 30, 30 plus years, the State Department fighting it all of the way. Um, and then um, I think the whole department um, benefited as a whole. And I was part of the beneficiary class um, that was actually able to become a political officer. Yeah, I, 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 w I wanted to follow up on that because that's the Palmer case, yes. right? So, in, 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 and you talk about this, a couple things about, so I, I'd like you to say more about that for, so, so, so um, we can hear about it, but also what I thought was interesting, and, and it, it completely resonated mm -hmm. with me, the, the fact that you didn't actually talk about the fact that you benefited from the Palmer case, that that's what got you into the political cone. Right. Um, because you were worried that people would think that somehow you were an imposter, that right. you were there unfairly, so. Yeah, so I mean, there was this whole culture that you know women basically didn't deserve a seat at the table, certainly not at the policy negotiating tables, at the, uh, at the table where, um, where political decisions were being made for the United States. And so um, I, um, you know, when I was offered um, you know, this remedy, this legal remedy, I thought really hard about it because I knew uh, that not only did the State Department as an institution oppose this, 
um, but was forced um, by you know, a number of courts that they had to provide these remedies. Um, but the culture within the department, I mean, all my bosses, all of whom were male, felt that this was wrong, that women were, you know, incompetent women were being given a leg up at their expense. And, you know, this was broadly discussed, um, and so it wasn't a secret to me. <laughs> and so, you know, I thought about this, you know, do I want to actually uh, take part in a legal remedy? And I decided yes, because this is the only way I will be able to do the work that I want to do that I know I can do. And so I took the remedy, but I didn't tell anybody in the State Department that I was doing this because I was worried uh, that they would think less of me, that I, had, uh, that I only got the job um, because of the lawsuit, which was right, but that therefore I couldn't do the job, which was wrong. And so, um, yeah, so I didn't talk to anybody about that for years, not through being the number two at, a, at an embassy, not through being an ambassador three times. <laughs> you know, so clearly I've proved that I can do the work by this time, right? Um, but the gaslighting of, you know, what you can do and how you can do it and what, you know, the culture tells you is very strong. And so when I sat down to write the book, I thought, you know, do I share this? And I felt I had to share it because it was one of the ways, you know, my story set apart, it was one of the ways that the culture at the State Department changed because it was forced to change by a court of law. And um, that was, you know, a, a passage for all of us. And I um, felt that I had to share that um, in this book. And I will tell you that there are so many foreign service officers that have thanked me for uh, sharing, that, women, <laughs> um, that have thanked me for sharing this because, you know, they experience many of the same things. Um, and uh, at an event like similar to this in New York, I met one woman who said that she too had been offered a remedy, um, but um, so the remedy went to people in the Foreign Service, but also people who had um, who had applied for the Foreign Service and who had been, um, you know, uh, not admitted for prejudicial reasons. Um, I, and um, she said, but I, you know, my, my life had moved on. I had married, I had chosen a different career, I had children, and so I wasn't going to join the Foreign Service. And I thought, you know, it's so poignant um, that there were so many people affected by that prejudice against women back in the day. And so just one last note, I should have said this up front. The courts found that the State Department um, discriminated against women in the intake process, so, you know, when you take the exam, um, in the placement process, um, the acceptance process, in the um, assigning of responsibilities, so are you going to be doing administrative work or are you going to be doing political work, um, and then, um, you know, as your specialty, and then they also discriminated against um, putting people into jobs and in promotions. So basically it was a clean sweep. <laughs> there was no other category where you could, um, you could have uh, discriminated against and if, uh, women, and if, they, if there was a category, I'm sure they would have. But it was, um, it was pretty compelling, I think, and um, I think that it was an important, um, it was an important lesson to me, you know, going back to what we said about, about luck in a certain way, that, you know, I had worked hard, my mentors had tried to get me into jobs in the political comb because they knew I could do the work, um, and yet none of that was enough. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you have to go to the court system to ensure that our institutions live up to our ideals. You know, hearing the story and, and, and hearing about the way in which you persist through these obstacles, um, it's, 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 it's actually, it's pretty daunting. And, and it makes me want to kind of turn to questions about other things that you faced, um, particularly towards the end uh, of, of your career. And you said this earlier. It struck me, it, you reminded us that when you stepped into, as you were approaching what then became your testimony at the first impeachment trial of Donald Trump, you didn't know how that was going to end, yeah. right? And, you know, again, reading your book, you talk about the fact you were worried about the possible loss of your job, the loss of your pension. You're trying to, to deal with finding a house. How, how did you work through what must have been, to my mind, an incredible amount of fear and anxiety and, and find the courage to be able to do what you did? Yeah. So um, there's, there's one other thing that I'll just, some of you may know this, but I'll just remind you. Um, there was what 
uh, former President Trump called the perfect phone call with President Zelensky in July of um, 2019. And um, I mean, I was aware, of course, of the phone call. I didn't know what, what was said in that phone call. But they talked about me, which is extremely unusual for heads of state to talk about an ambassador who has departed post. Um, but one of the things that Donald Trump said was, she's going to go through some things. So when the transcript was released in September of 2019, I read that transcript along with the rest of America, and um, everybody else was focused on the javelins, but I was focused on that because I thought, what does he mean by that? He's already fired me from my job. He's already trashed my reputation. What does he mean by that? And it was at this time that you know everything else was coming together with um, the committees um, rapidly becoming the impeachment uh, committee and um, you know, the desire to have not just me, but others um, testify. And, um, you know, I was, you know, I wish I could tell you that I was like, you know, raising my hand and saying, you know, I'm there. Um, but I honestly didn't think that I had much to offer the committee in terms of information because um, the conversation between the two presidents took place long after I had left Ukraine. I mean, I wasn't privy to what was going on. But they wanted to hear from me. And um, so, um, you know, I was trying to work through this, and I was fortunate that I had a really great legal team, a pro bono legal team, um, because believe me, you don't want to go into a situation like this without legal representation. So, um, so we were working through all of all all of the issues, and I, um, you know, in the end, it felt like there was no other choice except to testify because. Um, Congress is a co-equal branch of the U.S. government with the executive branch. Um, one of its, um, you know, bedrock um, duties is to provide oversight of the executive branch. And, um, you know, this is true whether it's a Democratic Congress or a Republican Congress. And as we saw in the Republican Congress um, before, uh, before, I mean, Hillary Clinton spent hours testifying on Benghazi and various other things in that same kind of oversight um, uh, role that the committees had. Um, so this was not an unfamiliar concept to a Republican administration. Um, and so it, it felt to me that this was a constitutional um, imperative almost, that um, the Constitution foresaw this role for the committees. Uh, the Constitution foresaw the idea of impeachment, however it ends up, and that if the committee was calling me up, I felt I had to go as an American citizen, even if I didn't have, you know, information that was um, particularly relevant. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I thought about, and, you know, we talked about this yesterday with the fellows, you know, in that time, there was a lot going on that I couldn't control. I mean, it was happening all around me, it was happening to me, and I couldn't control it. But you can control yourself. And so what, you know, how do you want the story to end, you know, when you look back um, and people describe your actions? And what I knew was that I wanted to do this with as much, you know, dignity as I could summon, um, both for myself and the State Department itself. And I wanted to um, be able to look myself in the mirror, <laughs> you know, every day that I did the right thing. And so that's, that's essentially what, uh, what took me there. And then would you say, so one thing, actually, let me take this back, because one thing that I've noticed over the last couple of days of talking to you about the fellows' projects, about politics, is that you have a lot of faith, I would say, in people's ability to find their courage, mm -hmm. right? I remember we were talking about, the, the, for example, the group that was talking about sand smuggling, that it is important for people to be able to take risks mm -hmm. to stand up, right? How do, you, how do other people find this courage? You say it so matter-of-factly, right? And, and yet I get a sense as much as I like to admit I would be okay, would I? Would I be able to stand into that same role? So how, how would people find that courage? Yeah, I, I mean, it didn't feel like courage at the time, <laughs> you know, honestly, and it's, you know, it, it, and it's not how I view myself. Um, it, it, it felt like it was the only option that this was something I had to do. And um, I, you know, didn't feel particularly brave. Um, you know, I, I wore my little little socks that said, and still I rise, <laughs> and, you know, various other things to give me courage. Um, 
it didn't feel like courage to me. It felt like the only thing I could do. But I think that one of the things we need to realize is that, um, you know, we are, you know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. We, um, but I think most of us aspire to living a life of integrity and, um, you know, doing the best that you can do. And you stumble and you fall and then you try again the next day. Um, and I think that um, integrity, being an ethical individual, um, it's, you know, that's a muscle that you have to practice. I mean, you don't, um, you know, if somebody comes up to you, you know, tomorrow and says, you know, I've got $10 million for you if you will do, you know, X, this horrible deed, you will say no, because that's crazy. But, you know, unethical acts, um, whether it's in government or outside of government, it, it, it starts, you know, with the little things where you're like, yeah, it doesn't really hurt anybody if I cheat on this paper. I mean, what does it matter? And then, you know, it, it, it kind of escalates and pretty soon you're in a place where you can't get out of it because, you know, <laughs> you're just in a world of hurt. And the same thing is true with corruption and bribery, where you start down that path and then, you know, the people who are paying you, they own you because they will destroy you if you don't keep on doing it. And so uh, those are dramatic examples, but I think you know, if you try to do the right thing you know, in your life and in your work every day, you build up that muscle. And it's, um, so when you know, the testing time comes, so to speak, and we, none of us knows when, what that is gonna be, and it's gonna be different for everybody, um, you're ready. Um, you're ready, you have you know, the resilience, and you have the right mindset in order to do the right thing, even if it comes at a cost. I think I heard something what you were saying, which in, in some ways it seems like the problem is we think of courage as that moment, something's going to feel really good. Like courage is going to make us feel better. We, we did something and it was easy to realize, no, it's actually very hard. And it's learning to do very hard things. Speaking of very hard things, I, I, I know a question I wanted to ask you, and, and this kind of brings your career and Secretary Albright's career together, is when she would sit on the stage and, and, and dialogue. One thing that we always talked about was the role of empathy mm -hmm. in diplomacy. Um, and she would talk about, and I was always struck about the need to balance both empathy, the ability to see the other side and the other side's interests, right, mm -hmm. with holding true to your own principles. Right. How have you brought those two goals, that holding true to your principles, but empathy into your own career? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a balance, uh, like, like everything else is, you know, between uh, interests and, um, and our values um, and, you know, empathy and, and, um, and keeping true to our principles. So I'll give you an example. When I was in Kyrgyzstan, uh, we had a base uh, for uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, our operation in Afghanistan. That base was critical to everything we did there. And a huge part of what I did every single day was ensure that the base um, was safe and secure in Kyrgyzstan because the Russians were working against us. They kept on working on Bakiyev, the president at the time, to cancel the, the, the base agreement. And it was just a constant rear guard action. And so, you know, another example of disinformation um, where um, the Russians and others around Bakiyev uh, were sharing with Bakiyev that, you know, the US government, i.e. me, was trying to depose him. We wanted somebody else to be president. And, um, you know, first of all, that was crazy because we had a base in the country. And, you know, you don't want revolution and anarchy in a country where you have a U.S. base that was so critical to our interests. Um, but, you know, Bakiyev had come to power himself um, because um, he had deposed his predecessor. So he was a little, uh, you know, nervous about things like that, shall we say. And he was extremely unpopular because even though he came in on a wave of reform and, you know, um, cleaning up the government, the first thing he did was, you know, populate key ministries with his relatives, and they started raking in the cash, and the base was, was a part of that. And so um, he was very worried that um, the same, he would have the same fate as his predecessor, Kaif, and that we would be the source of, of that. And, you know, he was being fed um, all of this information. And so my constant um, you know, I would have lots of meetings with him where I would try to reassure him that this is not what we were trying to do. Um, but, you know, he was afraid. Um, and, you know, this is when it, where it gets to, you know, the empathy part, where um, he was afraid. He was an alcoholic. He was being preyed upon by those around him, even as he himself, not a very you know, he's not a very sympathetic kind of a guy. Um, even as he was preying on his countrymen, 
uh, rather than actually leading them into a brighter future. And I just kept on trying to remind myself that, you know, he's human too, and he's afraid. And so we need to, you know, work with him and help him understand that the U.S. has enduring interests in Kyrgyzstan, and you know, he's a part of that equation. Um, it's not that we are supporting him or supporting an opposition member or somebody else to be president. We are partnering with Kyrgyzstan, and he is the president right now. Um, but it was sometimes a, an uphill battle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are almost at time, so I want to end with a, with a final question, because mm -hmm. I know your own commitment to public service and, and, and diplomacy, and I know that you are committed to rebuilding diplomacy and public service in this country and across the world. Here's a great population to try to recruit. If you wanted to give a sentence or a couple sentences of a pitch to bring these people into public service, what would you say? I would say, um, you know, you can do public service at many different levels, you know, at the, at the, um, at the local level, at the state level, or the equivalent of the state level, at the national level, and you can make a difference in people's lives. Um, you know, I think often we sit around, or at least I sit around, and I complain about, you know, some, something. Um, well, you know, you can jump into the fray, and you can make a difference. You can, you know, um, start a reform, you can provide better services, you can make the people in your local town, um, you know, you can provide them with the services that they really need. Um, and I think there's no better feeling, like I said before, of being part of something bigger, of being part of public service, of being part of the national dialogue. And um, I would encourage you to think about that as you think about your future careers. Ambassador Bogdovich, thank you so much for joining us here at the Albright Institute. Thanks to all of you. And that is it for our dialogue. So do feel free to spend a few moments in chatting, but we'll be wrapping up, I believe, in a few minutes. So thank you. <laughs>